the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Will he hear praises? He hears faith.
Welcome, I'm Heather Moss, KP Kids and Bridge Leader here at Cawprey Community Church in Lenexa, Kansas. Remember to visit cawprey.info to check in this morning whether you're joining us online or in person. I am here to share some exciting news about one of my favorite events of the year, Vacation Bible School. Registration is now open and here's what you need to know. Our VBS theme this year is Treasured, where we're learning about how priceless we are to God. This event is open to all ages from preschool to completed fifth grade. VBS will take place on July 25th through the 29th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. right here at Caw Prairie. Guess what? This event is completely free. However, if you feel called to donate, we would love to have a $10 donation to cover materials costs. Go to cawprairie.info to register. We still need volunteers to be crew leaders, so if you love kids and you love having fun with them, this is the best job for you. So visit me or check out cawprairie.info to sign up. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or needs you have, and we look forward to seeing you at VBS. Hey, Capri, this is Pastor Chris, and I am sitting here in my office at home, and I just put the finishing touches on this week's service. And um, this is quite a bit earlier in the week than I normally do this, uh, but there is a reason for that. Um, as I mentioned last week, I am taking a little time off. Uh, I'm using some saved up vacation days uh, to step away throughout the month of July uh, to rest and recharge. I'm going to work on my ordination a little bit. And uh, yeah, so I was finishing this up, getting it ready to go online. And I wanted to well, do this uh, to say, well, that I'll see you guys in August. Um, but as I've thought about this time off, it's it's really hit me how important Sabbath is. You know, I know like many of you, 2020 was tough and going into 2021, sometimes it's just felt nonstop. Like I've been on a treadmill that's not ending and I've noticed that, well, it's affected me. My health has not been great. My mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual health. And I, I've just realized the importance of Sabbath. And as I've thought about that, I'm reminded of some of Jesus' words in Matthew 11, where he says to his followers, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And, and I just... That's the kind of rest I know that I need, that, that rest in my soul. And so that is what I'm hoping to find. And for any of you who are tired or weary, that is my prayer for you too. And that rest is made possible by what Jesus has done for us. And that is why we take this time every week to take communion and to remember the sacrifice he made so that we could find that rest. And so we remember the night that Jesus gathered around the tables with his disciples. And when he did that, he explained what he was about to do, that he was going to go to the cross for them. And as he did, he held the bread up and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. And then he held up the chalice and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. This is the new covenant that we have. And then he told them to do this in remembrance of me. And then he would have prayed with them. Most likely the prayer he had taught them to pray, that I'm going to ask that you pray with me now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. So at home, I want you to take your bread or your cracker. I want you to take your wine or your juice. And as you dip, as you eat, as you drink, I want you to remember what Jesus has done for us and the importance of finding rest in our life, the kind of rest, the kind of peace that we can only get from Jesus. God, I thank you for everyone who is joining us today. 
I thank you for this amazing community you've given us called Capre Community Church. Please be with us as we go through the rest of this service and let us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for joining us today. Happy 4th of July, Caw Prairie. Notice I didn't say Happy Independence Day, and there's a reason for that. Because, well, in 1776, the signers of this Declaration of Independence, well, they weren't at all sure that they were going to be successful. Did you know that so many of the signers were pretty young? In fact, I read an article that called them the, the revolutionary millennials because so many were in their teens and 20s. Thomas Jefferson himself was only 33. I mean, this was a young group that, that had aspirations for the future. So they declared independence, but there was by no means certain 
they were gonna get independence, which is why we call it the Declaration of Independence and not the Guarantee of Independence or the Achievement of Independence document. I mean, it's, it's a statement of aspiration more than actuality. And in fact, a lot of who we are as, as people, as Christians, as Americans, is, is really aspirational. I mean, I think about recent political slogans, yes, we can, make America great again, build back better. Heck, even the old school, liberty and justice for all. Those things aren't accomplished yet, but, but they're things we aspire to. And that's always been part of America, to reach for the heights of greatness and well, even more importantly, to reach for the heights of goodness, America's had to work hard, sacrifice, and, and then when we make mistakes, because we show sure do, we have to be mature enough to admit it and then actually repent and change course periodically and develop better habits. And habits don't happen automatically. They, they get formed in our families for sure, but they need reinforcement. They need reinforcement from teachers and coaches. They need reinforcement from pastors and, and youth advisors. They need reinforcement from the role models around us. Habits are so important that they can't be left to an individual or even to a family. Habits get developed because we're a neighborhood. And people who love the people in their neighborhood care enough about them that they, form, no, that they form a community that parents and families can lean on to teach one another how to be good. You know, a famous politician, well, or infamous, depending on your political stripes and perspective, um, once said something that I think is profoundly unpolitical, non-political. She said, it takes a village to raise a child. I think, holy cow, that's totally scriptural. And you know, it takes countless good villages of good neighbors to make a country great. Or even more to the point, to make a country good. And Jesus once told a parable about good people. I would clump them together and call them good neighbors. And, and he gave them so much praise and such a reward. But they hadn't done what they had done seeking praise or seeking reward. In fact, they weren't flashy or famous things. They were kind of probably the things that you and I, if our neighbors did them, we might not even notice very often. They didn't do them to get credit for them, but they did it because they wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to honor God, maybe. They wanted to make their, their neighborhood safe. They wanted to make their children see what goodness and righteousness was. Jesus caught them in the act, so to speak. And that's what I want to do now. For the next four weeks at Caw Prairie, we have, we have caught people in the act of being good neighbors. And we're going to watch them. We're going to watch and listen to them as they share some of their story about, about doing the right thing. But we're also going to look more deeply into God's Word and see how we can find God's heart if we peer into His Word and peer into the neighbors next to us. Today, actually, we're going to start. We're going to start today is July 4th. Independence Day, 4th of July. And did you know that a good fraction of those signers were first-generation immigrants? Not, not, not a majority, but, but a good fraction. And those that weren't first-generation immigrants who you know, got off the boat recently, a good fraction, the rest of them, their parents or grandparents were new to the country where they had come seeking more economic opportunity and sometimes to flee potential oppression or violence. So when I think about it like that, you've heard the expression, as American as the 4th of July. I want to suggest to you, we could just as accurately say something is as an American as being immigrants, right? In fact, there's a famous 1700s or 18th century, to use the, the kind of cool talk, there's a famous 18th century founding father who signed the Declaration of Independence, who was an immigrant. In fact, who got so famous, He's on one of our most passed around bills of currency. I won't tell you which one, I'll let you figure that out. In fact, as an immigrant, he was so foundational in creating the infrastructure that America built on to become the great and good country that we have, that I'm just so excited to cite him on July 4th, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and point to him is probably one of America's most influential early immigrants. You may not have heard of him, um, but he's kind of a big deal on Broadway now and on Disney+. Plus. Take a look. 
Alexander Hamilton was born to unmarried parents in the British West Indies. Because his parents were unmarried, the Church of England would not allow him to attend their school. A tutor and the family library of 34 books provided Hamilton's education. Hamilton's father abandoned the family, and shortly after, his mother died. All that was left to him was the family library. August 30, 1772, a hurricane devastated the island. Hamilton wrote a sweeping account of the storm. Local businessmen were so impressed with his writing that they paid for his passage to America to get an education. The 17-year-old immigrant student wrote one of his first political writings in response to Samuel Seabury's pamphlet attacking Congress. This resulted in a verbal battle by pamphlet between Seabury and Hamilton. Hamilton ends his final argument by saying, I consider civil liberty in a genuine, unadulterated sense as the greatest of terrestrial blessings. The Battle of Yorktown, 1781. Monsieur Hamilton. Monsieur Lafayette. In command where you belong. Are you saying no sweat? We're finally on the field. We've had quite a run. Immigrants, we, we get, get the, the job, job done. <laughs> Interestingly, late last night, a group of Caen Prairiers, adults and teenagers, got back from their mission trip to the Mexico-Texas border. I guess a Mexican-United States border, but you know how Texas is. Anyway, they were down there trying to understand, with the help of, of a great organization, Border Perspectives and YouthWorks, our youth ministry partner, our, our youth mission trips partner, they were trying to understand more deeply about what it means to be a migrant, an immigrant, a refugee, not just, not just the impact on American citizens, but on the, on the difficulty and burden and impact on those migrants themselves. And so I look forward to having them share their stories over the course of the summer, and I give thanks that they're back safely. But today, I wanna get our, I wanna get our message series Neighborhood Watch started with an interview with a very impressive immigrant herself. She's the chemistry professor at Donley College in Kansas City, Kansas. Her name is Ana Maradiaga, and she gave me the privilege of sitting down with her in her lab this last week and talking with her about what it's like to be a Christian and an immigrant and what she's come to learn through her story and the stories of others. Anyway, I hope you'll enjoy the interview. I wonder if I should have asked her if we could sing it. Well, hi, Caw Prairie. I am Pastor Dan McKnight, and I am a guest in the, in the chemistry laboratory of Professor Ana Maradiaga. Maradiaga. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, Professor Maradiaga and my wife, Laura, are uh, co-workers, colleagues here at Donley College in Kansas City, Kansas, which has the unique distinction, I understand, of being the most ethnically diverse college in the American Midwest. Yes. And so... Um, I'm here today to, first of all, because I, Laura and I, we think the world of Anna. We helped, uh, if you see some of the um, test tubes in the back, we helped unpack those several sure. months ago. Yeah. So uh, we kind of feel like we're insiders here. Um, but I wanted to be here and I'm grateful that uh, I got the blessing of Anna to come and have this interview because we want to talk about America as a land that's been blessed by immigrants. And here on July 4th, which is when the first time this uh, sermon will be airing, I wanted to have us as a, as a congregation, as Christians around the country, and some of you around the world, think about what it means to be an immigrant, what it means to care and love, care for and love immigrants, and to remember and reflect that that was the history of our nation too. So, um, what do you think is better? Can I call you... Professor Mardiaga? Anna. Uh, okay, Anna. All right, good. All right, thank <laughs> yes. you. That makes things a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so, Anna, you are an immigrant. Tell us about how and why and when you came here. What's, what's your story? So, um, I came to the States. I um, had um, always my dreams was of studying abroad. Both my parents had the opportunity to study abroad. So, um, my dad studied in Russia, my mom studied in Colombia, um, and we were originally from Honduras, so they both, um, you know, they, they, at home we always heard the words, better take care of your grades, you have to have good grades, um, you know, you have to accomplish more than what we did, 
So it's a pretty, you know, high <laughs> high standard that we had to live up to. Um, and so, you know, since I was young, I started studying, studying, and studying, until um, I, I applied to the Fulbright scholarship, and I got the Fulbright, and I wow. came here. And I, um, when I came to the United States, and, and then that's fate. Um, I kind of um, met again with one of my uh, former boyfriends from high school, uh, and he had been kind of, you know, the, the, those who you part with, but always keep a good relationship, so we were always good friends. Um, and he had happened to go to Chicago to study in culinary arts, and I happened, because you, you choose three different universities, and you don't really know where you're gonna end up at. I had, you know, Texas, I think it was Purdue and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he just happened to be in Chicago, and I happened to go to Urbana-Champaign. Okay. And so, you know, then things, we got back together, we saw each other, and just took it off from there. Um, so eventually we got married. He already had his life here in the United States. Um, so I did have to go back to Honduras because um, Fulbright, what it does is that it helps people from the other countries. They help with your professional development, but then you're committed to go back to your country and give back. Oh, right. And so even though we got married, I had to go back to Honduras, live for two years, um, you know, play out my commitment and then come back. And were you yeah. were you working in academia or in industry? Yes. So when I um, part of the scholarship I got, it was as a faculty member, mm -hmm. and so I had to go back to the university teach, um, and then back here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when you said when you remind me that your husband is a chef and you're a chemist, it reminds me there's that book like what heat, fat, salt, and something, and like it's the how to cook anything? Yes. So do you guys eat really well at home? Yeah, too well. Okay. <laughs> yes, too well. Well, yeah. well what, has been, what has been some of the highlights and some of the lowlights, if there have been any, mm -hmm. about being an immigrant per se? Has, has America, to you, been a, a welcoming country? And what do you see now that you would share with your fellow Americans about what it means to think about immigration? Um, when I think about being an immigrant in the United States, as a government, as a country, it has opened it, you know, its doors. Um, as I said, I've been here w as a Fulbright scholar, mm -hmm. so that means that I owe no money mm -hmm. in terms of education, which I think it's even better than many of the people here in the United States. That's um, true. So it was a blessing. I, I remember I was in Nebraska. So many people opened the, uh, their homes to us. Go Huskers. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. I was in the University of Nebraska. They, that was kind of our introduction into American life and culture. Oh. Um, and, and, you know, it was also welcoming. So I think as a student in a college, in a big international community mm -hmm. as UIUC, um, I felt welcoming. It, you know, I never really felt anything that I could say would shade the fact of being an immigrant. I think that the change came when, and it's not about the city per se, but it's the different role. So when I came to, to, um, to step to to work. So my husband, you know, we we did everything correctly. Like I did the two years, and then he petitioned for me, and then um, and by that time we already had a daughter. So me, me and my daughter came, um, and so when I started working here, then I started. E even if I was a, at a community college, the stereotypes. I think it's something that kind of hurts because you know you, you come from academia you came from state from teaching in Honduras and I came here and um, they always assume I was always either you know running errands or cleaning the lab or um, you know and and, and and not to say that those are not good jobs but it's also discouraging to think that they cannot imagine that I would be the professor mm -hmm. you know and so um, those are kind of the things that that you, it takes you back. Um, I will say though that Kansas City is a very nice community. Like most of, I have five, wow, almost ten years. It, time flies by, um, but it's uh, around eight and a half years um, here in Kansas City, and I can say it's been very few moments that I felt 
unwelcomed. Okay. But there has been some, um, you know, when all the political environment started to change, um, we had people, my husband was driving one time, I think, and I, we had my daughter in the back seat in the baby seat, and then we have our, our um, my son was, ha was just born, so that was around 2015. And somebody just crossed our car and said, go back to your country. And, you know, and, and um, my husband started to get mad, but I always told him, you know, we have the kids here. It's not worth it. Just, you know, let it go. Um, but those are diff difficult times because um, many times, um, you know, we're here just to work and have perhaps a better life. You got to admit, Anna's resume is pretty unique. You know, you could even say privileged. I mean, privileged like a lot of us here in Johnson County, Wyandotte County, Douglas County, Jackson County, I mean, where we are here in the Kansas City suburbs. I mean, think about it. She had scholars. She had a great scholarship. She got married to a former high school sweetheart. She has a job with lots of impact, professional respect. Hers is not the story of an unlucky immigrant. But even the small episode she did share about the jerk who cut them off with their car and yelled at them to go back home remind us of the pain of being, in her case, a Hispanic person in the United States of America. Which, for a Christian, ought to make us pretty sad, heartbroken even, because in the book of Genesis, the Hebrew scriptures tell us that the first humans were made in God's image. And because they emerged, we know from both scriptural, scriptural indications and from uh, archaeological indications, they emerged in probably modern-day Iraq, we ought to assume that they were much darker skinned than at least people like I am. Like, give, give a look. So God created human beings in his image. In his image, I mean, look, we all look like one another. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So, so I wonder if it breaks God's heart when you and I, we see people who don't look like us, look like us, and we get afraid. We, we feel discomfort or even, even distaste. Instead of like joy and curiosity that, Hey, can you believe it? Like, we're both in God's image. I mean, imagine walking down the street seeing somebody completely different race, different look, different hair, and just hollering at them like, Yo! Hey! We both look like God! You probably ought to stay on the other side of the street because who knows what kind of interaction that could provoke otherwise. But, but the point is, we're made in God's image. In fact, if archaeology and scripture is accurate, Probably the more darker skinned you are, the closer you are to God's yeah, original family. Now, obviously, immigration today does have those kind of racial overtones, but it also involves some legitimate policy and economic and cultural debates, and, and Christians can be on different sides of that. Probably the most talked about thing in recent years, anyway, has been the, something called the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Basically, we could deport you, but we won't now. And you got to pay a lot of money in order for us to uh, let you stay here. So, obviously, it's a little bit political. And I want you to know, as a community church pastor, every once in a while, I think it's an obligation that I have, that, that we as leaders have, to make sure that those of us in the chairs, we have a handful of facts. So when, when we're talking about things, you know, we don't make Jesus look bad by not knowing whereof we speak. And I say that because I learned some things in this kind of two minute clip that I want to share with you from Professor Ana Mardiaga. Take a look. What about the DACA <laughs> students? Um, and what, is it, what does it mean? What are the limitations, the hardships, or, or the privileges of, of being a DACA student? Because not everybody is going to know what that really means. We've just heard it on the news. So a DACA student was benefited by the program, um, a, a deferred action in which they are allowed to, to study in the United States um, to make mostly work because they have a social security number. Um, it gives them temporary protection against being deported. Um, so in some sort of way, it allows them to legally be present here. But it also does not allow them to be a resident, which means that they're not el eligible for any uh, government help for they cannot be funded through um, any scholarship that is NSF or in, in terms of science or, for example, any scholarship that comes from um, the Department of Education. So any government funds, they're not FAFSA eligible. They cannot 
take um, those student loans that have to do with FAFSA either. Like no, no money. And so every time you see a student that is DACA, um, most likely they're paying their way through college. Mm. Um, they are allowed to work, but even they, if they're even if they would qualify smart enough, hardworking enough to get a scholarship, they can't get it. I've seen students who have like you know amazing GPAs, great scores in standardized testing, uh, but because of their legal status, they are not eligible for many scholarships. E even, you know, when we manage here, many of the scholarships are limiting into that. It has to be a resident. Um, and, and so these students, they pay their way through. So you see these students are those that really study hard because they know what it takes to take a class again. Yeah. So many of them, and I had friends in college who couldn't speak in, it's any Spanish. And they were worried because again, what would happen if they were deported and taken back to their, their countries of origin? They had no family left, or they did not know the family that was left, or, or, you know, because they've never been able to go back. They don't know the language. Because they speak English yes, fluently. They speak fluent English, but no Spanish, um, you know, and, and so it's very hard. It's, it's, it's a really hard situation. And when in the past administration, um, some of the DACA students, um, the, the, they, they started to push and, and actually the program was about to be canceled and it went into those legal battles. We would find here at Donnelly some students, you know, in the corners crying because they didn't know what was going to happen if they were going to be deported, if they were going to lose their jobs because their jobs had to comply, mm -hmm. you know, and if the program was canceled, then they were no longer eligible to be their employees. And so, and that income was the main income at their house. They had big dreams, you know, these students have big dreams. If they're making the effort of paying their way through college, it's because they really want to study, like really. And whenever that program was almost canceled, they lost all hope of their dreams coming true. And they came here as minors, they didn't have a say in if they were bringing them over or not. And most of them have done very good. They have studied. Um, during the pandemic, I think we all heard that many of the paramedics, nurses, are m most of those people were a lot of DACA students. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that being raised in, you know, you're grateful for what you're given, but you also want to help others. And I think right. that's what comes into play when you see all of these people serving, um, you know, in, in all of these institutions, especially when you want to serve the weak mm -hmm. in, in the health sciences, for example. So, yeah, and, you know, um, these students are here um, because they want a better life. And they certainly are having it better than mo than maybe they would have in their countries of origins. Um, so they're here to serve. And I think that as much as we can give them an opportunity to advance and accomplish their dreams, because they're getting it even more tough than, you know, everybody complains about higher education being so expensive and so hard. But for them, it's even more. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, and as, a, as a guy that's getting older in years and it someday will be retired, I'm, I'm, I'd like a go-getter energetic workforce to like help pay into Social Security and, and, and be, so I mean, there's selfish reasons, but there's also the Christian reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I sometimes wonder if, if the angel hadn't told Joseph to bring his family back home, back home to Nazareth, um, Jesus would have grown up in Egypt as a is a foreigner, right? And I mean, I'm sure God would have still accomplished things, but uh, it was that close. And, and that's the situation for, for so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of people in America today. Yeah. So Anna portrayed those DACA students, not just as dedicated, hardworking, and ambitious, but oftentimes as, as people who wanted to give back to their new country, to the United States out of gratitude to take on jobs as nurses or EMTs, particularly in the, in the last pandemic. And in her words, to serve the weak. And when I hear serve the weak, I'm reminded of that parable that Jesus told, that prophecy that Jesus made, that Matthew recorded in his gospel, and that we're going to be taking a look at just a little bit every week. Would you listen with me? But when the Son of Man comes in glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. 
All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger. The Greek word also means foreigner. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Listen. Listen to what the king calls those people who were helped by the kind neighbors, who were helped by the sheep at Judgment Day. The church, the community volunteers, the teammates, the the next door app friends, these are the regular Joes and Janes, the regular Jose's and Maria's, the regular Abdul's and Amira's. These were the kind people he calls his brothers and sisters. They're his family. These are the royal family of the King of Kings. And think about it, if we've been created in God's image, and and we love it when people are nice to our family, imagine how God's heart feels when we're nice to His. Speaking of nice neighbors, let's check in with Anna one more time and see if she's got a little bit more to teach us. I just want to brag on on Anna a little bit. Uh, You were telling Laura the other day that she led a retreat for uh, 15 or 16-year-old girls um, 15. 15. That's yeah. quinceanera, right? So yeah. you were waiting, uh, leading girls to to understand themselves as daughters of God, and in preparation for that big Hispanic celebration of 15 year olds. And yeah. um, so clearly, you're dedicated to your faith. You invest a lot in in teaching children in, in the in the way of faith. What does it mean for you as a Christian to to be both an immigrant and an American? Um, is there a particular particular set of perspectives that you bring to that unique demographic that you occupy? So I would say, um, and and this kind of goes along with other things that we talked about the Bible, and it's um, that Jesus himself with his family were immigrants, Mm. you know, in a strange land. And I always say, and and think, you know, how they went home to home asking um, Joseph and Mary, asking to stay and so many doors were closed and so um, you know in this country whenever you think about the role of the immigrant and how many doors are closed um, you know whatever we can do as a community um, as a Christian and also as an immigrant that has the possibility of helping Mm -hmm. then um, to do it. So many of the things, you know, the advocacy, I'm always looking for ways in which I can support those who support um, immigrant groups. Um, I always think that, and I think this is the most important thing, is the prayer. Prayer for understanding, prayer for patience from from all of the sides. A lot of prayer um, for compassion. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, something that's really missing and it's a key. I think the compassion and understanding. Whenever I have an opportunity and people ask me like, why? Why do people come? Um, And I was sharing with Laura when she asked me about this, I said, my my experience as an immigrant certainly was very different. I mean, I came to study, um, I came with a visa, I had- A paid scholarship, the whole deal, right? Yeah, Um, but I think the, you know, the, the greatest difference is that I came without fear. Mm. And, um, and, and it, it, it's very hurtful to acknowledge that so many of my friends are really scared to be here because they love it here. They have opportunities that they wouldn't have back home, but, um, but they're really scared. You know, they're scared because they have children that 
they have a good solid life here and if they're taken back to Honduras for example that wouldn't be the case like they know that back home there's not opportunities many of them were um, you know sought after by gang members because they wanted them to join so that's why they fleed it and they came here just to avoid that um, other friends who just you know didn't want to go back to poverty because for example, being here in the United States and being a mechanic it is a very good job. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it pays for a fair wage of living and providing for your family in Honduras. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so even just, you know, simple jobs, cleaning, picking up after others, you know, in Honduras it doesn't give you a living wage and here it does. Mm. And so many of the people that are here, they, they come not seeking even the big jobs, just, you know, simple things that they can do to keep their, their life um, safe. But at the same time, they're really scared because they don't know, um, you know, if, if this is going to be the, their de last day here, if oh. they're going to be deported. Um, we've had friends who, and as I said, this is where our role happens is both my husband and I are here legally, so our friends have given us a power of attorney to take over their kids if they're deported. An example, right? And so um, that's something that has to be done because then we are going to be in charge of if they're in school, finish their school year, and then take them back to Honduras to them. When I think about how my life was different coming here le legally, it's the fear, but that also is a responsibility because it, it allows us to help others, you know, and, and see how we can make their life a little, at least be less worried of what could happen. So to whom much has been given is much expected. Yes. And you seem to, to recognize that. What I just, I'm just getting all teary-eyed thinking about the fear that you name that, that I, I better make sure one of my friends in town has power of attorney in case I get swooped off the street or out of the grocery store. Yep. Um, wow. You know, uh, and for those of our, for those that are watching maybe that aren't as, aren't as biblically literate as the professor and, and I, right? <laughs> when, when you mentioned Jesus was an immigrant, I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, I always knew that, yeah, uh, Joseph in the dream was warned to, to go to Egypt, right? So that he wouldn't be, he and the child wouldn't, they and the child wouldn't be killed by Herod. But I was also remembering, as you said that, oh yeah, they, they, were, they were migrants on the census run, right? They were in Galilee and then they had to go through Samaria. They were foreigners through Samaria and then they got back to Judean country, but they were still travelers. And, and how vulnerable that was. And we saw like a lot of immigrants refugees yep. today, they ended up sleeping in, in a cave, in a, in a barn, in a stable, mm -hmm. waiting, waiting for something good to happen. Christian sister, I am grateful that you uh, were willing to sit down with me, and I'm grateful for the work you do here, and I'm grateful for what a good uh, and friendly colleague you are to my wife. <laughs> um, and I just want to say on behalf of Copperary Community Church, thank you for, for taking this time, because I know this is a busy week for you. Thank you for taking this time to uh, help open our eyes and our hearts um, to what it means to be um, an immigrant and a, and a grateful American. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. So Paul wrote a letter to one of the churches that he planted, the church at Colossae. And they were having a hard time there getting along, being kind, being good neighbors. I'm going to quote you some of chapter 3 of that letter because I think it speaks to our goal of being good neighbors and watching over those that God has entrusted to us in our community. Let's take a look. So, Colossians 3, verse 7. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, gossip, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old nature and all those wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. Remember, Creator, we're all made in His image. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, that is, a foreigner, Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters. 
And Christ lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you should forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Church, that's my aspiration for my life, for our church, and yeah, for our country. So happy 4th of July, Caught Prairie. Stay safe. And may your heart really care about your neighbors and your neighborhood. And may you watch over them with prayer and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Stray.